We are in section 5.3, the definite integral and the fundamental theorem of calculus. We can approximate the area under a curve by making equal size rectangles and adding up each rectangle's area. The smaller the width of the rectangle, so as n gets larger, the more closely the approximation will be to the accurate area under the curve, as shown in the figure below. So the first one you can see that n is equal to 4, n is equal to 8, and then n is equal to 16. And we can continue this process on making n be even larger. But as n gets larger, the approximating area by adding up all those areas of each rectangle is closer to the actual area. When drawing the rectangles under the curve, we can either draw the rectangles from the left endpoint, right endpoint, or the midpoint where the rectangle touches the curve. It is usually the case that the midpoint rule gives a more accurate answer than using the left endpoints or the right endpoints. So area is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of that height, so f of x1 plus f of x2 plus f of all the way through to x of n. So adding up all those heights and multiplying them by that delta x, which is going to be that width where x sub i is the left endpoint, right endpoint, or midpoint of the ith subinterval. If the interval as x between a and b is divided into equal parts, so equals key here, and each delta x will be b minus a divided by n. So on the next page, so you can see that as you're completing this, you can either use what's called left endpoints, and that would be using the height, which is going from that left side, and I'm going to call that height f of x, and we'll say xi for each one. And we would multiply it by our delta x, which is that width. And so when we do that, we get that area of that first triangle there. And so to do this, we're going to do this continuously for all the triangles. So to find the area approximately, so again this is just approximately, we're going to add up the area, so all areas of each rectangle. And remember, the area of a rectangle is length times width, or for us in this case, it would be our delta x times our f of x. And likewise, using the right endpoints, you can see that for the first one, you're using the right endpoint, and then we have our delta x, and so that area is given by multiplying delta x times that height, which is f of x. You'll notice that the first one that we were looking at using the left endpoints for this graph was an under-representation, whereas using the right endpoints is an over-representation. So that gives a little bit too large of an area, whereas the left endpoints give a little bit too small of an area using those. And it's unique for each curve. Likewise, we can use the midpoint, if you see that that midpoint is touching the graph f of x and so that would be using that height there f of x and again delta x would be the same idea and that is usually the best one to use to approximate the area under a curve. So the example right below says approximate the area under the graph of f of x and above the x axis using the following method with n equals 4 so that means that we have four rectangles that we're going to be using a says to use the left endpoints, B says to use the right endpoints, and C says to use the midpoints. And we have f of x equals x squared from x equals 1 to x equals 5. And so since our function is f of x equals x squared from x equals 1 to 5, I know that my y values are going to go from 1 all the way to 25. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch this just so we get a better idea of what we're dealing with here. I'm going to count by, say by fives, and again I need to go up to 25, so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and again this would continue on. 
if we had more values we needed. And I'm just going to go ahead and substitute each of these in. So 3 squared is 9. Do the best you can. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. And again, this would continue on technically if we wanted to use more values. So the first part here says to use the left endpoints. So I'm going to go ahead and switch my color and draw this with the left endpoints. So going from the left over and down, up, over and down, up, over and down, up from the left, over and down. And hopefully you can see that this is an underrepresentation of that area. And so using the delta x, and our delta x would be equal to, and it's b minus a all over n. And so we have b, which is 5, a, which is 1, and n, which is 4. So we get 4 over 4, or just 1. And so for part A, it says using the right endpoints. And so what we're going to do is do delta x times f of x. So 1 times f of 1 plus 1 times f of 2 plus 1 times f of 3 plus 1 times f of 4. And f of 4 tells us the height of that last rectangle that we have. And so we know what f of 1 is. It's just 1. We know what substituting 2 is gives us 4, substituting 3 gives us 9, and substituting in 4 gives us 16. So adding these all up, we get 30. And again, this is an under approximation. And hopefully you can see that those rectangles add up to not give an area that would be equal to the actual area of underneath that curve. So I'm going to go ahead and look at B. B says now to use the right endpoints. So I'm going to go ahead and switch colors here. And so using the right endpoint, I go straight up from the right side, which is from 5, over and down, from 4, up, over and down, from 3, up, over and down, and from 2, up, over and down. So for part B, I'm going to start from the right side, since that's what it was. So it's 1 times f of 5 plus 1 times, and again, still that same delta x here for all of these, 1 times f of 4, plus 1 times f of 3, plus 1 times f of 2, and that last rectangle was defining the height with f of 2. And so we have 1 times 25, plus 1 times 16, plus 1 times 9, plus 1 times 4. Hopefully from this one you can see that this is going to be an over approximation since all of our rectangles are above the curve. And so this works out to being 54. And this is an over approximation. So switching the color back to black, we're going to do the midpoint method, which is part C. So with the midpoints, we're going to be using 1.5, which is in between the 1 and 2, to define our height. And so drawing up to the curve and down that would be the midpoint. I'll kind of shade it since we have so many lines on there. The next one would be from 2.5, which would go up to the graph straight across. And again, I'll shade that so we can see it a little bit better. The next one would be from 3.5, straight up to my graph and over. And again, there's that area. And then the last one would be from 4.5 up to the top to where it touches the graph, over and down. And I'll shade that again, just so we can see that. And so again, that midpoint method is usually the better approximation. And so we're going to have delta x, which is still a 1, times f of 1.5 plus delta x times f of 2.5 plus our delta x times f of 3.5 plus delta x, which is 1, times f of 4.5. And so to find f of 1.5, we need to substitute in 1.5 and square it into our function, which is f of x equals x squared, which is 2.25 plus 1 times 6.25 when you substitute in 2.5 plus 1 times substituting 3.5, we get 12.25 plus 1 times 4.5 squared is going to be 20.25. Working this out, we get 41. 
and that would be the better approximation to use. Also, if you notice from part A, we had an under approximation, so that was too small, which was 30. In part B, we had an over approximation, which was too large, which was 54. And if you notice with this midpoint method, it does give us something in between those. A definite integral is the integral of f of x dx, but what, you, what you'll notice this time is gonna be there's these little values that are gonna be on the integral symbol, and this is going from a to b. So this is asking to find the area under a curve between a and b. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx gives the exact area between the graph of f of x and the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. It is also the integral from a to b of f of x is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of what we were doing up above. So saying instead of four rectangles, we had an infinite amount. So we have the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says assume that f of x is continuous on the interval from a to b and that f prime of x equal f of x on that closed interval from a to b. Then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to f of b minus f of a. So what you're gonna to need to do is to integrate this. And then once you have your answer, you're gonna substitute in that upper limit of integration first and then subtract away, substituting the lower limit of integration. Note that there's no constant term c, which is gonna be needed. And if you notice down below, it's shown that if you were to work this out and substitute in first b, you would have f of b plus c, and then you would subtract away f of a plus c, and those c's would cancel so we don't need to actually write them down. Informally, the fundamental theorem of calculus, or the FTC, says that we can evaluate a definite integral by solving for the antiderivative f of x, substituting the limits of integration of b and then a into f of x and subtracting. Notice that there is no constant when evaluating a definite integral. So really important to remember, I will show that they do actually reduce out in one of the examples, but it's a good thing just to remember. So we have properties of definite integrals. The big one here that we have is going to be that number four, and it's gonna be the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to negative, and when you do that, your limits of integration will actually switch, so a will be on top and b will be on the bottom. The other properties say that suppose that f of x and g of x are integratable over the interval from a to b and k is a constant, then we're able to take the integral of each of those terms individually. If we had a constant, we can pull that out. The um, negative integral from a to b would flip, and those limits of integration would flip from top to bottom and bottom to top. If you're integrating from a to a, there's not going to be any distance there, so no area, so that would be zero. And if you're integrating from a to c, you're able to pick a point that's in between that, a value, and separate it. You can find the area of the first part plus the area of the second part. The example says, given the integral from 2 to 0 of f of x dx is 2, the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx is negative 3, the integral from 2 to 4 of g of x dx is 4, and the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx is 1, use the properties of a definite integral to evaluate the following. So the first one that we have is going to be the integral from two to four of two f of x minus g of x dx. And so we're able to take the integral of each of these terms individually and that two can come out in front. And so then from here, we know that the integral from two to four is given, that is just negative three minus, and the integral from two to four of g of x is also given, and that is four. And so working this out, we get negative six minus four or negative 10. Part B says find the integral from zero to four of f of x dx and I don't have the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx, 
but I do notice that I have the integral from 2 to 4 and then also from 2 to 0. So this would be the same thing as saying the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx plus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx. So just splitting that area up into two pieces at 2. And I don't have the integral from 0 to 2. What I do have is the integral from 2 to 0. And since I flipped those limits of integration, I'm going to go ahead and give that a negative sign plus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx. And so now we have the negative, and then we have the integral from 2 to 0 of f of x dx is equal to 2, plus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx is equal to negative 3. And so this works out to be negative 5. Part C says find the integral from 1 to 4 of f of x dx. And so for this, I have the integral from 0 to 4. I also have the integral from 0 to 1, both of f of x dx. So I'm going to go ahead and take the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx and subtract away that little area from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. And so the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx was defined as negative 5 since we have that in our previous part, minus the integral from 0 to 1, which was given to us up above, which is equal to 1. And so this will equal negative 6. The next example says evaluate each definite integral. And we have the integral from 1 to 4 of 3x squared dx. And so the first thing that we're going to do is integrate this and we have 3 times, and it's x to the third over 3, if you were to integrate this. And let's just say we put a plus c, so we can show that this is actually going to cancel out, and we don't need that plus c. And we need to evaluate this from x equals 1 to 4, because those were the limits of integration that we were given. If you look on your integral, the 3's are going to reduce out, and we're left over the x cubed plus c, evaluate from x equals 1 to 4. So you always start by plugging in your upper limit of integration, which is the top number. And so when I do that, I have 4 cubed plus c. And then you subtract away and you substitute in the lower limit of integration, which is 1 cubed plus c. So doing this, I get 4 cubed, which is 64, plus c, minus 1, since 1 cubed is 1, minus c. And if you notice, your c's will reduce. And then we have 64 minus 1, which is 63. Part B says the integral from 0 to 5 of the square root of x dx. And so in order to do this, I'm going to rewrite the square root of x as x to the 1 half. And adding 1 to the exponent, we get x to the 3 over 2. And again, you can divide by 3 over 2, or the same thing as multiply by that reciprocal, 2 thirds. I'm not going to put the plus c, because hopefully we can see that we don't need it, since they will cancel. And we're going to evaluate this from x equals 0 to 5. So from here, we have 2 thirds, and then substituting our upper limit of integration, it's going to be 5 to the 3 over 2, minus 2 thirds times 0 to the 3 over 2. And then to work this out, we have 2 thirds. 5 to the third is 125, so it's going to be the square root of 125 minus, and then this would just be 0. And so this works out to being 2 thirds times the square root of 125, or as a decimal, it's approximately 7.45. The example continues on to the next page. In part C, it says find the integral from 1 to 5 of 2x cubed minus 3x plus 4 dx. So going ahead and integrating each of these pieces, we're going to get 2 times x to the 4th over 4 minus 3 times x squared over 2 plus 4x. And we need to evaluate this all from x equals 
our lower limit of integration is a 3 and our upper is a 5. I'm going to simplify this a little bit first and then substituting these values. So this would reduce and I get 1 half x to the fourth minus 3 over 2 x squared plus 4x. Then we're going to substitute in our upper limit of integration which is 5. So we have 1 half times 5 to the fourth minus 3 over 2 times 5 squared plus 4 times 5 minus, and then we're going to substitute in our lower limit of integration, which is 3. So we have minus 1 half, 3 to the fourth, minus 3 over 2, 3 squared, plus 4 times 3. You can substitute this whole thing into your calculator or kind of go piece by piece by piece, but this is going to simplify to 256. Part D says evaluate the integral from 1 to 3 of 2 over y dy. And so for this, if you think about this, this is the same as 2 times the integral from 1 to 3 of 1 over y dy. And integrating 1 over y dy is going to be that natural log of the absolute value of y. So this is going to be 2 times ln of the absolute value of y. And we're going to be evaluating this from y equals 1 to 3. And again, we're writing y's this time since that's what we're integrating with respect to. And since these are saying dy, that means that these values here correspond to that variable y. And that's the values that we're going to be integrating from, from 1 to 3. So substituting in the upper limit of integration, we get the absolute value of 3 minus 2 times ln of the absolute value of 1. And hopefully we remember that ln of 1 or you can see it on your calculator here, is equal to 0. And so this is going to be working out to 2 ln of the absolute value of 3. And you do not need those absolute value lines. You can leave them on there, but technically you don't need them since the absolute value of 3 is just 3. We have two more parts here, E and F, but I'm going to go ahead and circle and we'll look at these ones together in class. The next thing on this page is going to be the net change as an integral of a rate. And so it says the integral from t0 to t1, the rate of something, is equal to the net change in something between t0 and t1. The net change in q of t, the quantity, over an interval t0 to t1 is given by the integral. So going from t0 to t1, of q prime of t dt is going to be equal to q of t1 minus q of t naught. And so we have one example right after this that I'm also going to go ahead and circle and we'll look at that one together in class.